thank you very much. Uh, thank you also for inviting me to uh, share some of my work with you. Uh, what I'll do is I'll give you a talk, talk, kind of talk. <laughs> what we'll do is I'll, I'll just share some of the work that uh, I'll be doing uh, with uh, our group, Jamia Teachers Solidarity Association. What we've been documenting uh, for the past at least five or six years. And I'll basically tell you some stories uh, and then maybe we can you know, draw some conclusions out of those. And the idea is to look at <clears throat> the kind of narrative of terrorism that one sees in the mainstream media and to see the other side, you know, behind these sensational headlines and these bombastic music and, you know, Ek Antakwadi Pakda Gya, Dhar Pakda Gya, or Itna RDX Pakda Gya, Uske Saath. Behind these sensational headlines, uh, what really goes in and uh, <clears throat> What I try and do is to look at the various actors which are involved uh, in this whole process of creating this uh, narrative and let's try and deconstruct uh, some of these. And uh, the, the major, uh, you know, uh, one can call them the actors of the counter-terrorism uh, counter narrative, one can identify the, uh, say, the investigating agency, the police, the special cells, the ATS, the crime branch, the Greyhounds and so on and so forth. Every state has its own uh, agency. Plus you have the National Investigating Agency, the NIA now. There's that. Then there are of course the prosecutors and the judges, the, you know, the, you know, the judicial system. Uh, then you have the media, uh, very important, which actually uh, creates this whole, I mean, which kind of systematizes and, you know, out of this uh, hazy, uh, details emerging from the prosecuting and the uh, police agencies creates this very well-concealed narrative of uh, who is a terrorist, what is a terrorist, which are the terrorist groups, what are they doing and so on and so forth. So now, <coughs> uh, let's try and look at <coughs> some of, uh, uh, I'm going to discuss some, uh, just share some stories with you, some cases that we have been documenting. Uh, we've documented <coughs> uh, cases from the special cell. In fact, in 2012, we brought out this report called Frame, Damned and Acquitted, uh, which was, <coughs> which looked at 16 cases uh, of terrorism, where the special cell had claimed that these, uh, the accused, uh, the people whom they had arrested were either, you know, operatives of Gucci or LET uh, or some such, Al Badr, and most of them were Kashmiri, Pakistan trained Kashmiri militants, which is uh, which is a, which is a headline that you will hear or uh, read very very often in uh, various newspapers. So we started to look at these cases, and uh, what we found was that in case after case, uh, you know, and these were cases that basically what we did was we didn't have an idea about how to collect these cases. We had just these vague, you know, one would uh, read. Uh, a little story or a snippet buried some you know somewhere in page 13 or 14 in the daily uh, paper which said another terrorist let off for lack of evidence you will find these stories quite regularly you know, that huji militant was acquitted for lack of evidence prosecution could not produce any evidence so we started looking at these cases and what we found was that it wasn't just for lack of evidence that these people were being let off or acquitted it was actually the courts were finding, and the courts were saying, and in this report we did not interview um, any of those who were acquitted, we did not interview the families, we did not interview the defense lawyers. What we did was just to look at the judgment, uh, the judgment of the sessions courts, and we found that the session, the, 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 you know, the, the trial, the, the judge was saying that, uh, you know, the, not only is there no evidence, but whatever evidence is there has been systematically manufactured by the special cell. So we found, in case after case after case, we found A, that all the FIRs were identical. You would find uh, one simple narrative which would fit all the FIRs. For example, all FIRs would begin by saying, secret information was received in the police station. The secret information was pertaining to some militant who is about to enter the city of Delhi. He will be carrying arms, ammunition, RDX, and whatever you have. And we developed this information, we set up surveillance, we set up electronic uh, surveillance and so on. We developed this information and we found that this man, is, this militant or this operative is coming to town on XYZ date. So we set up 
you know, uh, so we got this secret informer to come with us to identify this militant. Now the secret informer, when we, when we saw the secret informer, uh, when we saw this militant, the secret informer pointed out to that militant and thereafter we called out to him, he refused to surrender and we kind of dhar the bojo him. That's the story that is, in every single FI you will find the story. There is, there is, there are some minor variations, sometimes it will be at a bus, bus station, at the Kashmiri gate bus station, at the Mukarba Chow bus station, sometimes it will be at the, at the railway station. But I mean that's how far their creativity will go. Beyond this, even they kind of don't realize where to go. So uh, every single FIR we found had similar, uh, you know, stories about the secret informer, about whom no detail was ever present. Uh, you know, there was no information about who the secret informer was, what kind of information, what grade of information was being received, and so on. So now the courts found that a, despite the fact by the police's own admission, the special cell's own admission, that they had advanced information about this uh, militant coming in. They made no attempt to include any, uh, you know, public witnesses, uh, despite the fact that there were uh, these so-called arrests were made in, uh, uh, you know, railway stations or bus stations or maybe some 15 kilometers away from the special cell office. And on the way, uh, you know, on, the, on this whole stretch of 15 kilometers, there were several government offices. The the special cell made absolutely no attempt to uh, include any public witnesses in their search and raid operation uh, and, and their arrest in their operation. So now, uh, and of course, the special cell would say that oh, we went, we asked bypassers to you know uh, uh, to join us in our search, but they went away without giving us their addresses and names and phone numbers, so we couldn't do anything. So this was one. Secondly. In every single case, the police would say that, the special cell would say that we have recovered these, you know, when we, when we caught this fellow getting off from this bus at my Palpur Chowk, we found that he was carrying these two bags and they were full of explosives and uh, 6 lakh rupees or 7 lakh rupees or these arms were recovered. Now, despite the fact that you're catching somebody red-handed carrying all this cash and explosives and so on, you make no attempt to find the source of this. That there is no further investigation ever in these cases. You know, that's the end of the story. No further investigation to find out where this 6 lakhs or 7 lakhs came from, where this RDX or ammunition came from. And, uh, you know, th that th that's the end of it. Now, in, in, in one of the, another case which is not included in this report, but which is going to be in um, a report that we are, the second, we are just bringing out the second edition of this report. And in that, uh, th this case, the special cell claimed that they had, actually caught somebody with one and a half kgs of highly explosive TNT, which is, you know, which is highly combustible, one of the most explosive substances uh, known to man. And then when, and the police also says when, when uh, the court asked the special cell to produce it in the court, because they only had that one or two grams which was seized as, you know, as sample. So when the court said, you know, but where is the rest of the one and a half kg of RD uh, of TNT? They said, oh sorry, you know, there was a fire in the Malkhana, and the TNT evaporated. <laughs> you know, that, that that's the kind of you know evidence that is being uh, produced in court. That TNT evaporated, and this highly explosive chemical evaporated instead of catching fire when the Malkhana uh, you know uh, caught fire. So that's the kind of you know, and then these are really serious, uh, you know, terror cases that we are talking about. So all, I mean, very similar uh, kind of, uh, the, there was a systematic kind of pattern that one saw to these fires. But, you know, we've also done uh, documented cases from Rajasthan, from Madhya Pradesh and elsewhere. And it seems that all agencies are kind of afflicted with this disease of creating, manufacturing terrorists. Now, one of the most common uh, logics which is kind of given on television among the commentary uh, is that, oh, but the police is under so much pressure, you know, they have to crack the case. So they must do something. So, kabi kabi, you know, it, these mistakes happen that, you know, sometimes, you know, under the pressure of media under the pressure of politicians that the police will sometimes you know try and for quick results they will you know take shortcuts and, and, and do this but the point is if you look at a large number of these so-called terror cases you will find that they, they are not connected at all to any event of violence which has taken place 
as a result of which there might be pressure on them to perform in, 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 in such a manner. A large number of these, in fact, I would say overwhelmingly uh, the, num uh, the cases booked under now the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act across the country do not have uh, any basis in any actual event of violence, whether it's you know a bomb blast or whether it's um, you know firing or any other incident of violence. Now, when we went to Madhya Pradesh to um, you know there were seizures in 2011, uh, 2012. So we went to Madhya Pradesh, uh, looked, and we were trying to look at this series of arrests. But what we were confronted with was a huge number of cases booked under UAPA across district. In every district of Madhya Pradesh you will find several cases, several people, several young men, Muslim men, uh, arrested under Unlawful Activities Prevention Act for being members of Student Islamic Movement of India. Now you know that SME, uh, Student Islamic Movement of India, or SME was banned in 2001, just days after 9-11 uh, in the US. Not in, and they were banned, and it said, you know, that uh, they were actually, it's almost like a response here that you, you know, in, into to what was happening in the US. So uh, they were banned here by government notification, and immediately, right after the ban, in the, say, the ban happens in the morning, is notified in the morning, and in the evening you see these, you know, large number of arrests taking place across the country. Uh, people who had copies of the Simi, uh, you know, magazine, they were arrested, or, pe or office bearers who had copies of Simi, uh, you know, receipt books or uh, membership slips and so on were arrested in the evening. So, for material that was perfectly legal an hour ago uh, was deemed to be, you know, unlawful uh, uh, evidence of unlawful behavior. So, if one really looks at this whole, you know, and I'll come to just in a bit uh, to how evidence is kind of created in, in these cases. But if you look at the law itself, Unlawful Act Activities Prevention Act, what does it say? It says that uh, an organization can be deemed to be unlawful by the executive. But this, so the government will decide which organization is to be lawful and which organization is not to be uh, uh, lawful. And it is entirely on the subjective bias of the government that an organization gets labeled as unlawful. But even if, I mean, okay, so far so good. So the government will say that Simi is unlawful, but RSS is perfectly lawful. Bajrangal is lawful, uh, Ram Sena is lawful. Now there's Hanuman Sena also, which is uh, there in Karnataka. So all of these uh, different Senas are lawful, but Simi should be declared unlawful. Even so, now how do you prove that somebody is in, and, and it's a, and how do you prove that somebody is engaging in unlawful activities? You, you know, so the law will say uh, that uh, you are engaging in unlawful activities by being a member of an unlawful organization that you or that you are furthering the activities of that organization. But how do you prove it? Because an um, organization which doesn't exist, which has been banned and been pushed uh, into the underground, so to say, how do you prove that somebody is a member of that organization? So very interesting. You have, in case after case, you have magazines being seized, as you saying, receipt books, now, over a period of time, what happened was 2000, the ban happens. 2000, 2002, 2003, 2004, all of these years, continuously across the country, you will find cases being booked under UAPA against Muslim men for participating in unlawful organization called Sikhi. And what is the evidence? The evidence is that they had copies of Islamic movement, which was the official magazine of Sikhi, uh, copies of receipt books, copies of uh, you know, uh, some other documents belonging to Sydney. Now, over a period of time, we find that, in, especially in Madhya Pradesh, this is the trend that we found. By 2011 and 12, the police had probably run out of these copies. So they started photocopying. Uh, so you find photocopies of, uh, you know, the back page of, say, Islamic movement being produced as a Sydney parcha, uh, which was being distributed by uh, the uh, by the accused. So, this is how you create the idea of, uh, you know, somebody participating in the unlawful. And, I mean, it's, it would be hilarious if it weren't so tragic and real lives were not involved. But I just want to give you as an example some of the incriminating material that had been seized uh, by the Solapur uh, city police. This was uh, the Diwan of Ghalib, you know, the collected poetry of uh, Mirza Ghalib. And they said, oh, look at this 
पर्टिकुलर कपलेट इट सर्टनली इज अ जिहादी कपलेट एंड दिस वॉज मौजे खून से सर गुजर ही क्यों ना जाए आस्थाने यार से उठ जाए क्या says even if a wave of blood were to pass over my head it's not as if i would get up from my beloved store and this couplet was shown to be jihadi couplet because it's talking about wave of blood violence so obviously this must be jihadi couplet mirza ghalib must be definitely an ideologue of you know jihad and the person who possessed this copy of uh, ghalib's diwan must be a totally radicalized uh, islamic terrorist so that's the kind of evidence that is being produced now i uh, let me just share uh, actually a couple of cases with you uh, you know about uh, and from madhya pradesh so this case um, uh, the kind of evidence that so there this i mean again this case is a very 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 kind of famous case it's called the khandwa conspiracy case and uh, several careers were or in the police were made out of this case you know people got promotions and and so on uh, the police investigating officers who were part of this case they were all promoted to great ranks now in this case again there was no violence nothing not, no violence was alleged in fact in the cases we documented uh, i think about uh, we documented about 80 cases from uh, madhya pradesh not one of them pertain to a case of violence all of them were conspiracy cases that these people were conspiring they were hatching a conspiracy and they were furthering the activities of sini by distributing pamphlets but as if you look at the fires it's almost like these people had some kind of a death wish you know the fires will go secret information was received that mr x y z the accused is standing at the bus stop and screaming madly that uh, so what if the government has banned sini i will continue to be a member of sini i will continue to uh you know uh, spread the message of simi i will continue to be on office bearer of simi simi will never be you know uh, the government may ban it but simi is not going to die and i'm going to you know take it forward and so on so it's almost like the person is been possessed by some death wish in a in fir or fir you will find the same that after the simi was banned somebody was shouting and screaming in the public market and very conveniently also had uh, you know cash, uh, stashes of uh, simi purchases and posters in his pocket so that the police could very conveniently go and arrest him right there with the evidence so that's the kind of uh, you know evidence that we found now in this case uh, which also brings me to the point of judiciary as to what has been the response of the judiciary now if we look at this case uh, which goes back to 2006 there were uh, uh, there was no case of violence it just again says that secret information was received that somebody that two or three men are uh, uh, distributing semi purchases or pamphlets in a locality and we went there and we arrested them and then they said to us they said to the police that oh we got some other friends who were also engaged in the same activity why don't you why don't we take you to their houses and you'll be able to get a lot of evidence so then they go there then these two people whom you know the police has gone to they say oh we have got some more friends whom we can take you to so this way and the and the khandwa police goes to you know travels to different localities of khandwa then goes to kota in rajasthan then goes to uh, azamgarh in uttar pradesh then goes to you know jabalpur and other places arrest whomever it can for example it went to azamgarh it 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 went after uh, uh, falai the former general secretary of simi they he wasn't at home so they came back and and it was just that you know there was no further investigation if they had you know some you know uh hunch about him having been involved in anything they they didn't go back in the case so jo hath laga usko pakad liya jo hath mein nahi aaya forgot about it so they went to kota by the end of it they had some 14 15 uh, people who been arrested now in this case uh, the evidence again was that we went to their house and we had these sack loads of books which we have recovered from them there was no witness all the eyewitnesses uh, were very interesting one of the eyewitness was a local bajrangal leader the second eye witness to the recoveries was uh, somebody who had a criminal case lodged against him in the same police station the case was going on in the kotwali police station and he was the main accused of i think it was some car theft case so this main accused in the car theft case is the second witness the third witness is a young drug addict who uh, then comes to the court and says that i never went anywhere the police came and you know made me sign blank sheets of paper the court disregards it then this A boy this young boy is picked up by the police a few months later tortured 
and, uh, uh, and illegally detained in the police station. He commits suicide after a while. And all of this is in the papers. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, it's it's being reported in the uh, uh, in, in the local dailies. It has been brought to the notice of the court, but the court continues to say that I will not dis I will not believe his uh, you know testimony that he he was forcibly made to sign those uh, pachnamas and, and and so on. So that's the kind of witnesses which the court is accepting in this case. And the other evidence is also very interesting. Now, as I said, that the only evidence in this case was uh, uh, the recoveries that were made by the police. Now, as I already said, the recoveries are usually, uh, you know, semi documents or any other thing. But in this case, one of the, and there were two girls who were um, arrested in this, two sisters, Rafia and uh, her sister. Now, uh, one of the main pieces of evidence against Rafia was that there was a magazine called Tehrike Milat. Tehrike Millat has never been banned by any government notification. It is not a banned magazine. And they said that, oh, she is guilty of furthering the active activities of Simi because we have recovered this Tehrike Millat from her. And the Tehrike Millat, how do we know that the Tehrike Millat belongs to her? Because it's written in hand, Rafia. Now, very interestingly, that the same magazine, same magazine, not even, you know, it's the same physical magazine with Rafia written on it that appears in several cases, not only in Madhya Pradesh, but also in Maharashtra. That's shown as recovery in, in ATS cases in Maharashtra also. And in fact, it is so widely used that Maharashtra ATS changes the name from Tehrike Miller to Rafia Tehrike Miller. Because they think that it's actually, you know, that that's the title of the uh, magazine. So, so you have the Rafia Tehrike Miller appearing in uh, several cases. Uh, in it has been recovered in Mumbai train blast of 2006. It has been uh, recovered in a Simi case um, and has been submitted as evidence in the 2010 UAPA tribunal. Recoveries from Mohammad Najib Abdul Rashid Bakali and another Simi case, and also Malegaon blast case of 2006, uh, from, which has been recovered, said to have recovered from Anul Meyerkus, Nurul Hada. So, I mean, you can imagine not only the way in which evidence is fabricated, but the kind of close cooperation that we see between agencies across states. You know, often we see, you know, newspapers will often do this, uh, uh, you know, graphics, you will see. In the center will be, uh, Daudi Prime is old hat now, but in center you will see some, you know, uh, Bhatkal brothers, one of those Bhatkal brothers, and then there will be arrows going out, you know pointing to Azamgarh module, pointing to Kerala module, pointing to uh, Odisha module, pointing to Maharashtra module and so on and so forth. But if actually we were to uh, just turn the tables around, we can see the kind of, you know, linkages between these different agencies from across states and how they are closely cooperating in manufacturing terrorists, in manufacturing evidence, and in creating, uh, you know, this whole thing about, oh, there's so many terrorists all around. So what, what do you do? I mean, the UAP, as you know, that uh, when an organization is banned under UAPA, there's a tribunal which is supposed to, you know, uh, kind of adjudicate on whether the ban is uh, reasonable or not, right? Now, in every every two years now, of course, uh, the law has been changed and it's been amended and it's going to be five years now that the tribunal will sit. But, uh, so every two years when the tribunal sits, and, and Simi comes to contest the ban, which is another story because every time the state will say, oh, but you don't exist, how can you come and contest it? So it's this, you know, <laughs> that, oh, you have no locus standi, but you, I mean, if, if it doesn't exist, then you can't say that it's still engaging in unlawful activities. But it's like a kind of a, you know, tautology, but we will ban you because you, are, you, you exist, but you cannot contest it because you do not exist. That's the kind of, you know, logic uh, that, that is produced in every tribunal. Uh, it's only in this last tribunal, I think this is the eighth or the ninth tribunal, where the judge uh, actually said that, okay, you have locus stand I mean, that locus being granted after eight or nine tribunals. Earlier, even the locus was not being granted by uh, uh, by the tribunals. Now, in the tri what, hap so what happens is that every two years the tribunal sits. So now the police from various states will come and say, they will submit their affidavits, the home departments of various states will come and submit their affidavits and say, 
or sir, but you must ban uh, the ban on CV must be extended because their activities are continuing. And as proof of those activities, we have these you know 20 cases from Maharashtra, 30 cases from Madhya Pradesh, 15 cases from Rajasthan, 10 cases from Delhi, blah blah blah, and so, and so on and so forth. It goes. So it's like a uh, it's, you know it's like a cycle. So you ban. And so therefore the ban gives you a pretext to pick up more people and when you pick up more people, create more cases, that gives you a pretext to continue the ban. So it's like a vicious, uh, you know, cycle is created. And in fact in one of the affidavits in, in the Madhya Pradesh case, uh, placed before the 2010 tribunal, uh, there's this uh, investigating officer from Madhya Pradesh called uh, B.S. Parma, who gave a sworn affidavit saying that I arrested these people in Pitampur case. Pitampur case is one of the more high profile cases of uh, Madhya Pradesh. He says, I arrested these people and I found that uh, I got their cell phones and I found the, these contact numbers and names in the cell phone. So I wrote to the police department of various districts saying, these are the people in your district who belong to Simi, please take action against them. So after this letter goes out, uh, about 18 or 19 cases are registered in different districts. So this is how you know uh, new cases are being registered. So now to come back to this uh, our Khandwa case, this is the kind the kind of evidence that one sees is that you know the witnesses are all sham. Uh, the recoveries are the recoveries that I've just mentioned, you know, uh, which are all over the place everywhere, and yet the court says that these people must be convicted under. Unlawful activities prevention act and convicts all of them except for one, and that one is on technical ground because the sanction uh, for proceeding against him under UAP has not come even after the trial has ended. So that man has been in jail for two three years. He was given bail after much haggling, and uh, the sanction still doesn't arrive. So he's been acquitted, but the others, uh, you know, about 12 and 13, including Rafia and Asia, the sister, they're all convicted under UAP with this kind of evidence. In fact, if we look at, I mean, it's true that, you know, the other report, uh, the, the frame damned acquitted looks at cases where acquittals have happened. And it's true that, you know, there is a lot of vetting happening at the judicial stage. That, of course, the uh, conviction rates are low, are not so high, which which, which tell us something. But increasingly, there's, a, there's also a tendency or a trend that one, one can see. It's a very troubling uh, trend, which is to use uh, the idea of secure national security as some kind of an alibi for evidence, you know, as as long as and, and once these uh, PPs or public prosecutors are arguing for it every time in in the Butler House case uh, that that we follow, you know, every time the uh, PP was there was uh, yes, we do not have evidence, but sir, this is a matter of grave national security, you know, that these are hardened terrorists, these are you know uh, very tough terrorists and. Uh, you know, basically saying that don't ask for evidence, you know, in terrorism cases. But sometimes what we are seeing is also that the courts are succumbing to this kind of, uh, you know, logic of national security and terrorism being such a great uh, threat to our existence and sovereignty that we will let, uh, you know, um, the, the, the standard of evidence to be much lower. Now, in, in, in the Pithampur case, which I was just referring to, uh, in that case, uh, the police claimed that they had recovered uh, some magazines from the farmhouse of the accused, and uh, where this and, and they said that we had gone to his farmhouse and we had dug the ground, and we found a sack buried under the earth, and we recovered these magazines uh, from that sack, and which is definite proof of the fact that he's a very dreaded, you know, kind of semi operator. Now the defense argued that. A, there was no independent witness to the, you know, uh, the dragging of earth and uh, the, you know, the, the recovery of the sack and the magazines. Second, none of the magazines were banned by any government notification. Thirdly, none of them, even if they were not banned, there was nothing in incriminating in it. They were, they were just religious texts, basically. They were just religious texts. And, uh, you know, and, and fourthly, even if they were, uh, you know, problematic magazines. It did not link up the accused to the to any crime, uh, to any act of violence or terror or or any conspiracy. Now, to which the I'll, let me just read you that line from yeah. So the court says uh, 
that the prosecution witness 24 BPS Parihar. Parihar is the same guy who sent these letters off to various districts. In his cross examination, has refused the suggestion that this literature does not pertain to sedition but only to religion. This seems appropriate since there is jihadi talk about seeking revenge and it also excites. I mean, the level of you've just seen the level the Mirza Ghalib Shahri being turned into you know violent uh, intimations of some conspiracy. Now. He says, now this just says that see, this seems appropriate since there is jihadi talk about seeking revenge and it also excites feelings against other community and class. It is clear and pernicious articulation of the ideology of the banned terrorist organization and as such may be deemed to and as such may be deemed to be banned, whether or not a notification to that effect has been issued or not. First he says that okay, doesn't matter if it's being banned or not, it can be deemed to be banned. And then it goes on to say that sure there is no evidence in this case. But he says that in cases of terrorism, we cannot expect formal proof and we should not desire formal proof either. These are the exact words of the judge. That we do not, we should not expect nor should we desire formal pr proof in, in in these cases. So that's, uh, you know, and, and it's not some isolated case. If you look at, uh, I mean, UAPA is such that, uh, you know, of course, bail is very difficult and no, no judge is going to, you know, risk the collective conscience by granting bail to people who have been arrested on terror charges. But it is uh, a fact that, you know, if you talk to people who have been arrested under these charges, I mean, it's true that police is generally brutal, that uh, DK Basu guidelines are not followed at all in any, in, in any case, right? But what is happening is that with this whole question of terrorism coming in and this whole rhetoric of national security coming in, this, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, Erosion of due process, which would otherwise be questioned, is given a kind of veneer of legitimacy. That it's okay, you know, how else are you supposed to uh, then fight terrorism? You know, there are people like Praveen Swami who are writing that, okay, uh, let's try out torture. We don't know whether torture works or not. Maybe we should try it out and see. You know, what, what I mean, how does one try it out and see? You know, conduct experiments on, on uh, you know, accuse people perhaps put them on machines and see how much pain they can take and how much, I mean, some kind of strange idea of trying out ter torture, uh, you know, to extract uh, information about terrorism. So that's the kind of discourse that we are sort of, uh, you know, confronted with. Now, uh, and in fact, if you, I mean, if you talk to people who've been accused in these cases, you, I mean, all of them will tell you that when they were first produced before a magistrate after police custody, the, poli the, the judges and the magistrates refused to look at them in the eye because then they would have to acknowledge that you know their bodies were bruised, that torture had been inflicted on them and that they would you know either they did not want to recognize the fact that these people had been you know brutalized in police custody. And uh, I just want to refer to this case uh, in uh, you know the Bombay uh, train blast case, the 7/11. You know we want to put everything in you know these meta narratives. So 9/11 we must have our 7/11. Then we must have 26/11. So uh, the, these train bombings of 2006, uh, you know 11 July 2006. Uh, if you follow, and, and uh, I think the judgment is now reserved. We don't know it. It might be pronounced uh, you know whenever. I believe the judge has got his daughters to get married or something. So uh, the judgment will be pronounced any time, but we don't know what the judgment will be. But if you look at the way in which, I mean, it's one of the most sensational cases, you know, serial bombings in first class compartments of suburban tra trains in Bombay. Uh, and then uh, this happens on 11 July. By 13 July, all newspapers are reporting, which also brings us to the, you know, how media is creating these narratives. Uh, so on 13 July, the police is claiming through the media that we've cracked the case, that oh, there are these two, three people that we're looking for. Then it forgets about these two, three people. Three, four days later, it produces two other people arrested, Kamal Ansari and, and somebody else, as the masterminds of, uh, you know, the 7-11 bombings, that these are Sini men, and they fit the, you know, they're Muslims, they belong to a particular uh, age, particular class, and so they must therefore be, you know, who's going to question, in, especially in the media who's going to question. So they are produced as accused between July and September. There's a series of arrests. I think about 13 or 14 people are arrested by the end of it. On 30th September, the police commissioner of Bombay holds a press conference and says that the ATS uh, has done a remarkable 
investigation it's first class you know investigation and he's very proud of it and then in the press conference he announces the details about how they cracked the case what happened and uh, what is the entire conspiracy so he talks about in great and precise detail he tells us that simi and isi collaborated on this and how there were two pairs one from simi one from isi they worked together to create these bombs these bombs were then uh, you know uh, uh, rdx was um, uh, was got from pakistan ammonium nitrate was procured locally by uh, i mean this entire in detail story is uh, you know relate to the media that ammonium nitrate was procured locally by the simi men rdx is got from pakistan by the isi agent and as proof of uh, the isi connection they say oh there is this unclaimed body lying in the morgue he this guy must be selling from lahore we don't know his address but surely this is selling from lahore who was the isi in charge in this case now and they, the commissioner also says that oh the bombs were created they were you know packed in such a manner and then they were placed in cook pressure cookers which uh, and he given even gives the brand name of the pressure cooker that they were kanchan pressure cookers uh, you know which were planted in trains and when when these arrests are made when these you know people are arrested now between july uh, between august and september uh, till the press conference happens there are five remand applications filed before the uh, bombay high court uh, in the in, in the court in the magistrates court and not one of them is turned down and every time the ats says oh but we need the remand because we are analyzing the call data records that we are looking at uh, because they were in this is how uh, you know the conspiracy was unravel we know that they were in touch with isi people through their these phones and so we need to analyze the call detail records and we will just you know crack the entire case uh, so the impression was given that there were hectic investigations being taken pla uh, take, taking place and all of this was of course being dutifully reported by the press if you look around uh, you know at newspapers between uh, july august september uh, especially bombay newspapers you will find stories like how the 711 case was cracked ats discloses how isi help i mean all these kind of headlines and stories you will find in plenty if you uh, just google search for uh, new stories around that time now now these men are put in jail now in uh, the case went on and, and on and the 11, there was a 11000 page charge sheet was filed in 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 the court in makoka court but interestingly if you look at look through the 11000 uh, page charge sheet there is no mention of call detail records not one mention of call detail records it is not uh, adduced as evidence call detail records there is no mention of pressure cooker kanchan pressure cooker or any other pressure cooker there is no absolutely no mention instead there are some black rexine uh, bags which make their appearance now now these people continuously file an application in the court uh, the kamal ansari and atisham kutub and others uh, the other accused saying that please give us our call detail records because these will prove our alibi they will prove us innocent they will show the court that how we were either present in the site of the uh, the bombings they will prove that we were not in touch with anybody who is remotely related to uh, any conspiracy now uh, the ats said uh, but why should we give you the call detail records we have not adduced it as evidence we, we will only give you the material that we have used as evidence and the makoka court said right you don't you i mean you don't need to give them material that will prove them innocent you only need to give them material which will prove them guilty that's the court saying so twice this application got turned down uh, turned down then of course they went to the bombay high court and the bombay high court took a very severe view of uh, the ats and the makoka court's reluctance to uh, give this doc these documents to the accused but then the ats said oh sorry but we don't have them anymore we kind of destroyed them many years ago so we don't have the call detail records so sorry we cannot give you anything which will prove your innocence so i mean the, then the case went up to supreme court and so on uh, but even during the period of remand you know uh, we know what happened in the remand i mean if, this is just how to how to construct the story differently i mean if you look at only the press releases uh, which were published by the uh, uh, you know news dailies as investigative reporting which was basically they were just republishing uh, republishing the press releases of the police but if you look at some other kind of evidence for example if you were to look at the letters that Uh, the accused sent out from jail uh, 
the first set of letters was sent out by Shahid Azmi, who was their lawyer at that time. And it is, uh, and if you Google for those letters, I mean, you will find them. They are such horrible, I mean, they describe such undescribable brutality. It's amazing that it is possible within the human imagination to think up of such cruelty. The kind of torture chambers that the ATS has devised, uh, full of, you know, the use of cockroaches, insects, screwdrivers, uh, you know, our own indigenous kind of waterboarding uh, experiments. Perhaps this is what Pravin Swami wants to refer to as, you know, experiments in torture. So, uh, you know, all of that. But also, uh, and remember they will be charged under Makoka, which allows confession to be, uh, you know, submitted as evidence. Now, the, uh, apart from that, they also described how they were taken to the forensic science laboratory for their narco uh, analysis tests. And uh, multi uh, several times, not just once, but several times. Once, a uh, couple of times in Bombay, then they were, they, they were, they were taken to Bangalore. Uh, and the infamous Dr. Malini conducted the, uh, the Dr. Narco conducted, uh, you know, the tests on them. And uh, I just want to read out from the, uh, the CD of, uh, you know, uh, the Narco test. They were given the CD after when they returned back uh, uh, to Bombay from the FSL. They were presented the CD and said, "Okay, this is your, this is what you said in your, uh, you know, your narco test." Now, yeah. So the question is, how many bombs were planted? The answer comes from the accused: seven. The 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 accused was stunned to discover that their questions had been doctored. You know, they had been they, they had been asked some questions and they had given answers to that. But the questions had been changed in the CD. So the original question had been, what comes after 6? He had answered 7. Then the second question was, who was involved in the conspiracy of the blast? Dr. Tanvi, Etisham, Faisal, Kamal Muzammil, Asif. The original question had been, who are the people in the cell next to yours? So he had given Dr. Tanvi, Etisham, Faisal, Kamal Muzammil and Asif. So this is how, you know, the the... This kind of, and of course, I mean, if you look at how the, especially the stories like how 7-Eleven was cracked and so on appearing at that time, they all rely on the narco tests. All of them will say, you know, the narco tests have revealed the entire conspiracy, the conspiracy is unfolded, they have confessed to their involvement and they have told us how they, you know, how they paired with the ISI guys and so on and so forth. So, this is how the narrative of guilt, you know, narco tests are of course not admissible as evidence. But the fact is that they do help in creating a narrative of guilt. That, you know, and by the time, and in fact, if you look at all these new stories which appear, uh, you know, we can talk about this at, uh, at length later also, but the new stories which appear, all of them appear at a specific, before the charge sheets are filed. Right? So, when the person is arrested, and the, the period between charge sheets is filed, you will find all these, you know, stories appearing about confessions, about the conspiracy unraveling and so on. So by the time the charge sheet is filed and by the time the poor man can apply for bail, the you know the public uh, you know story is already built that he is guilty, he is admitted to his guilt. So this is the kind of you know, uh, and then of course these men write in the letters that you know we told the magistrates uh, that we are being tortured in the police custody, and yet five times the judge you know uh, accepted the applications for remand and sent them back to police custody to be tortured more. So, you know, this is the kind of system that we are faced with. We have, uh, you know, judges who might look away uh, when confronted by a tortured man. We have the media which uh, shamelessly, you know, builds on... In, in fact, in this report, you know, frame down the what we've done was we discussed these cases, case one, case two, and at the end of each case, we had given the, the stories which had appeared in the press at the time of the person's arrest. So it, it gives us very interesting insight into the way, you know. So this man, uh, Imran Ahmed, who is supposed to have been a 9-11 kind of a conspirator, you know, that he was supposed to have been doing some, uh, you know, flying course somewhere in Dwarka, actually. He was living in Dwarka, he was arrested in Dwarka. And uh, he, uh, so every newspaper is full of stories about how he intended to flew a play, fly a plane into one of the, you know, the buildings in, in Delhi and create another kind of 9-11 in India. At the end of it, 
they just figured out that he hadn't even ever applied for a flying course. I mean, he had no connection at all with any flying course. And <clears throat> the money that he had was, you know, uh, he borrowed some money from an uncle and he was going to return it. And that was, you know, shown as some money for, uh, you know, creating this, hatching this conspiracy. So you have this media which builds its lies. You have, you have the media, you have this, this kind of reportage, but you also have the, you know, the more the security experts who are, uh, you know, building their careers on creating these myths about these big terrorist organizations which are out to destroy India. Um, you know, Swami is one, but of course there are many, many others uh, who, who, who indulge in this. So, uh, and the latest entrant, of course, is the corporate sector. If you look at, and I just end with that, you know, if you look at uh, what happened after you know, the horrendous carnage in Bombay, uh, just days after the so called 26 11, uh, we have FIKI organizing a huge uh, conference, uh, first in Bombay, then in Delhi, involving all the, uh, you know, big corporate uh, leaders, and they bring out a kind of a blueprint. They, they give a, it's kind of an advisory which is meant uh, for the government. And I just want to end by, uh, you know, reading this uh, from the FIKI homeland, uh, you know, the FIKI task, it was called the FIKI task force report, report which was brought out after the uh, conference. So it talks about, uh, the war on terror cannot be won without sacrifice. National interest is paramount and should prevail over any other interest, even if they are constitutionally and democratically valid. That's that's the kind of you know. So you have the media, you have the uh, the judiciary, you have the agencies, but you also have this big corporate sector which is gunning for uh, greater and greater securitization. It's not only about protecting uh, you know. At that time, of course, there was a lot of hype around you know uh, the Bombay, uh, the all the hotels were targeted. So they felt that the corporate India was being targeted, but also the fact that there's a lot of money to be made out of the homeland security market. Uh, so there is this uh, investment in so-called safe cities, smart cities. All of that is also very, very well paying. So if you, if so, this whole narrative of counterterrorism also mixed up with this kind of technological fix uh, that is being, you know, uh, advocated by the corporates, and a kind of a techno security state is kind of staring at us in the face. I just end that. We'll now be opening the floor to questions. Uh, please keep your questions short and pointed and avoid cross questioning. Um, yes, ma'am. I was just wondering what you make of this kind of apology that exists among the public that the police is sort of forced to resort to fabricating evidence, it's forced to resort to torturing people, it's forced to resort to committing encounters because they're just so under-resourced. The police to population ratio is so low, they don't have adequate equipment and this is why they have to do this to maintain law and order and control crime because they don't have any other alternative. Do you think such a narrow economic approach really sort of gives a full picture of the problem or does it completely gloss over the institutional and systematic prejudices that exist within and the kind of disproportionate burden of police brutality which is borne by marginalized communities. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I completely agree with you that, you know, it's not, it's, this economic logic is completely spurious. And also, if one were to look at counter-terrorism especially, it is not conducted by a local, you know, neighborhood constable. It is by these very elite agencies who have uh, inexhaustible resources, whose funding is not audited, we don't know how much, and you know, IB especially doesn't have any, you know, it's, it doesn't even have statutory status for it to be under any uh, legal, uh, you know, mechanism. But even these, all these elite agencies who, I mean, these, these are not under-resourced or underfunded. They're in fact quite well-funded, very well-resourced. And if you look at, uh, you know, if you follow Special Cell, Special Cell on the side is making a lot of money. I mean, if you look at Rajbir Singh Kill get, gets bumped off because of some you know, nefarious land deal and so on. So I think this is just a, uh, it's interesting that a lot of people who would otherwise say that, uh, you know, there is corruption in the police, who would cry about corruption in the police all the time, but when it comes to terrorism, they display such great faith 
in, in, in the very same police, you know. Uh, so you had crowds who were uh, ready to, you know, pelt bottles and stones at the, at the police during the December 2012 Delhi gangway protest, right? The same middle class crowd would, uh, you know, uh, uh, would be gung-ho about a ter police operation against a terrorist. So I, I think at the heart of it is also what you said, you know, the, the institutionalized prejudice that we fail to recognize and acknowledge. Uh, that uh, you know, if you were to look at, um, it, it's it, the, the marginalized communities. You know, it's the, interestingly even the NHRC. Uh, if you if you look at the, the you know NHRC, the uh, Indian government hasn't allowed the UN Special Rapporteur on uh, summary executions and you know. Uh, into India for a long, long time. It was only, I think, a couple of years ago when, when they were first allowed to come in. And they had an interaction with the NHRC. So they said, you know, we've heard that, you know, there is this problem of fake encounters and so on. So the, police, the NHRC says, oh, no, it's not such a big problem because the only people who were being killed is insurgents in Kashmir and Northeast, uh, gangsters in UP and Bihar, and uh, terrorists elsewhere. So, I mean, this is the list of encounterables that, uh, you know, even the NHRC subscribes to. And if you look at the community profile of all of these people, of course, they come from the most marginalized section. So it is, it is, uh, you know, uh, the institutionalization of prejudice that we see. If, I mean, there was this whole halabu over, you know, when uh, Sunil Kumar, Sushil Kumar Shinde said, you know, that saffron terrorism, uh, he made that remark about saffron terrorism in the Jaipur conclave of the Congress uh, party. And there were, you know, one panel discussion after another on national television about how, you know, how can you equate terrorism with a religion as though, you know, you never equated terrorism with religion at all. As, you know, as though you're living in some kind of a, you know, some strange planet that you are completely divorced from the, you know, the kind of discourse that is happening. So suddenly saffron terrorism equates religion with terrorism, but otherwise it doesn't. And then if you were to follow those, I mean, I was looking at those panel discussions. So M. N. Singh, who was the investigating officer in the uh, Black Friday blast, hmm? the Bombay blast of '93, he says, uh, "If I let me quote from him, um, yeah, he says that uh, you know, saffron terrorism is a politically coined terminology. It's very handy for some people to counter the charge of the jihadi terrorism." In my opinion, there is nothing like saffron terrorism. It just doesn't exist in the Hindu pantheon. So this, I mean, this is after Samjhata, this is after Ajmer Sharif, this is after, you know, Hyderabad, Mecca Masjid and so on. So this absolute refusal uh, to recognize or to acknowledge that there is this deep-seated bias and prejudice at the heart of not only terror investigations, but at the larger discourse of terrorism, which everybody, you know, at least the middle class, public very, uh, you know, has deeply sort of, you know, internalized. 